Mike Tyson once said that everyone's got a plan till they get hit in the mouth. Well, tonight, Chevy and I had a perfect show planned out for you guys, but then my brother called because I forgot to shut off my ringer. My kids walked in because I forgot to feed them. We started talking food and Chevy got hungry. So now we're just gonna ask that you roll with us on this episode as Chevy and I just continue talking about our favorite thing and that's what we like to eat. Join us on the ride. Funny thing though is though I don't know if this is show worthy. Um, you know Amanda works at the airport and so she works all kinds of hours and and tonight we did kind of a uh, you know the high five in the air. I've she was leaving the house. I was coming back in from my real estate shoots and and, um, and now my kids are coming to me at uh, ten thirty at night. I'm hungry. Well, they already had some snacks, but they didn't have a dinner. I thought they had dinner. So I don't know a dad of the year. Not my proudest moment, I don't think, but uh... it happens, Shell. I mean, that's uh, that's 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 what happens sometimes. You you know, you're you're running so much, and uh, you can't do it all, right? But you yeah. know, I, I got three boys too, right? And uh, you know, same thing. You know, you, 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 what do you try for our kids, right? We try to get them to be independent, uh, to think for their own, and to make some some choices that you know give them some freedom to make some choices and and uh you know when i think about my kids and and uh many a nights where i came home from work late or you know i was running to get one to to hockey and while the other one was at home waiting or you know any number of reasons why they didn't eat at what would be considered a regular supper time and you know the the one thing that is tried tested and true around my house is that when my kids do leave, you know, and, and they live in a situation where they're one week with me and one week with their mom, um, you know, I clean my home and I find wrappers of granola bars and chip bags and veggie sticks. I find them like stuffed in the couch and uh, behind the couch and in books and in board game boxes. So what I surmise is that our children are, are, are um, very resilient and uh, although they would like you to make them food in this moment, chances are they're going to find something. Um, and, and, but, I think and, that, and that's well, just it. I mean, that's been part of the process. I've taught them how to cook. You know me. I love to cook. I have, like, we do probably, you know, three really over-the-top meals per week. Uh, make leftovers and they have it for their lunches and things like that. But one of the things I think that all boys have to learn, because I've got two boys, you've got three boys. Um, but one of the things that I think, you know, boys have to learn is how to fend for themselves. And, and cooking's a big part of it. We started them cooking eggs, scrambled eggs early on, mac and cheese, how to warm up wieners, how to run a, fire up a grill and do uh, hamburgers or whatever they want. And, and I'm sorry, but tonight, if you come to me when I'm already on the air or I'm getting ready to do a show, um, that's why I train them how to cook. They know well, where all the veggies are. They know where all the eggs are. They know where all the proteins are and they know how to cook them. And, and you know what, Sheldon, if you've taught them how to cook and I know my boys know, are, what do we got there? We got, we, we well, we my like, brother's calling me from uh, Texas. Oh, you didn't turn off your <laughs> ringer? Well, that's okay. This is only our third podcast. You want to get it? Yeah, there like, you go. Might as well get it right in the middle of the show. Tell yeah, me you're recording um, a show. Hold on one sec. Hey, Aaron. Uh, well, you're on the air right now. I'm just uh, we're just recording with uh, Chevy and Nasty. I got Randy on the air right now. Um, I don't think they can hear you, but uh, you are on. But uh, okay, here I'll uh, I'll sh I'll shoot you a message and you can call me back. You got it. Bye bye. Yeah, so the show must go on. And so your brother lives in Texas, hey? Yeah. Well, he uh, when when the. Uh, 2015, when the Alberta oil patch went to, uh, um, you know, went down, um, there was probably about a three-year window. Baker Hughes, who we used to work for, shut down their quill tubing division. Um, you know, he bounced around to some smaller companies, but he's just used to a certain level or a certain, a certain standard. Um, and it was really hard to adjust going from a great company to, you know, one of the smaller companies. So he ended up uh, getting signed on. Some Canadians went down to the States. Uh, a company in Pennsylvania got bought out by a company called Warrior. Now they're the second biggest um, uh, coil tubing company in North America. 
And uh, yeah, he's, he's down in Texas right now. Tonight, he's actually just driving from Midland up to somewhere in Oklahoma. He says it's a 14 hour drive. Um, but, oh, so he calls his brother. So he calls him. Well, yeah, you know, the, you I, know what? I, this show is about sons and brothers, right? We were just talking about, you know, your sons having to fend for themselves tonight. You know, my boys have, 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 have had to fend for themselves. And, and uh, you know, 14 hour drive. One day, you know, Adric, your son, is going to call your other son, Kai. When he's on his 14-hour drive, they're going to get there. But in the meantime, right now, it's 1030 at night, and they want you to make them some mac and cheese. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, if we get back to that, uh, you've taught them how to cook. You've taught them some essential skills. I've taught my kids how to make grilled cheese. They can make eggs. They can do a number of things. There's two things at play here. One, nothing tastes better than food that's made for you. That's why, uh, you know, um, restaurants exist. And that's why when we couldn't go to restaurants, Skip the Dishes, Uber Eats, and all those home food services blew up because people despise cooking for themselves. But what I will say is this. Your kids are way ahead of where I was and where probably you were when you went away to the United States for, for university. And when I was in university, man, my favorite dish when I was playing football was tuna surprise. And tuna surprise was easy. It was like you take a can of peas. You take some rice, you throw in some tuna, you throw in some salt, some pepper. You might find something in the fridge or in the pantry that you could throw in there. And the surprise was this, Sheldon. When you took that first bite, the surprise was whether it's going to be good or bad. But we ate that and we lived on that. And you know what? We, we, we survived. They're going to survive. And I think that's kind of what we were hoping to get with this show tonight right it's, well, it's talking about kids talking well, about I, yeah and, and that's just it and actually at some point you're not just uh surviving you're thriving so my 15 year old i started teaching him on the barbecue a couple of years ago because when your boys come over when your friends come over and you know this there's nothing better than one guy in the group throwing on the grill pulling out some steaks pulling out some burgers and just doing it up for the crew and that's one of those things, if, if you had no other skill that you could add to the group, if all you could do was cook and make sure that when the boys come over that everybody's fed, you're a pretty popular guy. Well, you know, you, uh, you say something that really resounds with me because I, uh, I wasn't much of a cook growing up. Uh, you know, I grew up in an Italian household. My mom cooked all the meals. In fact, if you went to help, you got in trouble. So, you know, early on, we stayed out of the kitchen. It was just the way it was. You know, my mom did all the cooking. She did all the cleaning. Then we, we, we reaped the benefits for sure. Um, you know, when I really learned about the value and really the joy of cooking was when I got into the fire hall, when I became a firefighter. Yeah. Uh, the firefighting culture uh, is, is hugely dominated by the food culture. You know, um, I was at a career fair today. And I talked about our day-to-day -day as a firefighter. And you li literally live in the fire hall. You live in the home. You take care of it. It's your own home. And when you're there for 24 hours, it's yours. And part of that experience, after you clean it, after you, you, know, after you take care of your rigs, your equipment, and you're ready for a call, waiting for a call, most of your day is, surround or is where you are surrounded by your, your crew, as you say, uh, at the dinner table. You're either having coffee, you're having dinner, or you're, you're cooking that dinner. And so... Uh, many times, like you said, the most popular firefighters are the ones that can cook up a meal. And, and, and I tell you, when you go to a fire hall where, uh, there are, uh, firefighters that have previous experience as a chef or a prep cook or someone that was a cook in the army, the meals are so much better. Like there's so, it, it, what's the word? Um, anyhow, but yeah, no, I, I totally get you. Like, uh, you know, growing up in the 80s, and again, in my neighborhood, different neighborhoods were different, different cultures were different. Cooking for me was a very foreign thing. And I learned that very valuable skill. Uh, you know, I, I learned to cook as an adult, but really to make and prepare meals for a lot of people. I learned that primarily, uh, you know, in my 40s uh, when I became a firefighter. So... Um... One of the things of being on keto is you have to eliminate all sugar. Yeah, so you and so I was sugar. talking to that my neighbor down the street. We're comparing recipes and notes, um, and um, you know, I said my one tough thing is at night I'd like to have 
you know, sip on something other than just water and coffee, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you can't have any juices or anything like that. He said, well, you can have like diet pops. I'm like, don't really want to do that. And so he started going uh, on and on about uh, BioSteel. So he said, here, I've got a bunch of these little packages at home. So he gave me a bunch of BioSteel uh, and mixes and as well as some other stuff that he didn't like uh, just to kind of try out. And that's my new kind of uh, go-to. So, well, yeah. BioSteel, I, I told you that my buddy invented that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and he's going to come on our show at some point. Well, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, is that, that's one of those things that uh, it started as a great idea. And now it's... You know, well, it started, you know how it started. My neighbor's talking to me about it now. You know how it started? It started as he was training NHL athletes and they're drinking Gatorade. And he's like, what are you doing? He's like, and they were like, well, this stuff tastes good. And he was saying, well, it's pure sugar. It's it's garbage. Yeah. So then he went to some people he knew um, and uh, he created this drink. It's evolved from his original pink drink, as they call it. Um and uh, he created this, and then, uh, you know, he, he trains all the NHLers. Like, it's a who's who. He's the guru. Uh, Matt Nichols is his name. And, uh, yeah, he, he, they, they got together with a couple of NHL athletes and some other people, and they put it together, and, and uh, BioSteel grew out of that. Um, he, re he, he recently uh, sold out of his shares of the company, but he invented it. And uh, uh, That's kind of fascinating when you think about it. That's like being the guy that – uh, in, invented Gatorade. Yeah, yeah well, you know, absolutely. He, he literally is that guy uh, in Canada, and it's it's Gatorade's number one competition. But if you took it um, uh, sort of quality uh, of product versus quality product, it's there's there's no comparison. It's way better for you and way better of a product. The only thing is, you know, Gatorade has the marketing juggernaut behind it that I believe it's is it Pepsi? Uh, Gatorade is Pepsi, and yeah. Powerade yeah. is Coke. So, you know, if you've got a marketing juggernaut that you're just not going to stop, but, um, uh, you know, they, they've, they've created their niche and I use BioSteel. I've used it uh, throughout my career. It's one of the only supplements I actually used because uh, I couldn't commit to any other supplements. You know, you know, uh, uh, the first few years of my career, I would, you know, uh, right after the season, like, oh, I got to buy the creatine and the protein and the, and the whatever it is. And, you know, I'd buy it and then it would sit in my cupboard for, 10 months. And then the next off season, uh, I, I would go out to buy more and I look in the cupboard and all the stuff there's from the year before, but bio steel really helped me. Um, you know, I sweat a lot and it's really good, uh, for hydration. Uh, and I always felt that, uh, it, it gave me everything I needed to extend a workout. You know, if I was working out for an hour and I, I was sipping it throughout my workout, I could, I could last an hour and a half and, and still have a lot of energy at the end, sort of leveling out. Whereas, you know, if I didn't take it, I'd kind of fall down. So I, I took it as a pre and post. I had a lot of problems with muscle cramping. Uh, and when I started drinking BioSteel, it really helped with that. So great product. I, I guess we're doing a show on food uh, <laughs> because, you know, we talked about our children's eating habits. We talked about uh, BioSteel. We've talked about eating in the fire hall. Um, you know, where, where do you go with this? Where do you go with a discussion on food? Cause we thought it was going to be a discussion on parenting, but you know, uh, your, your child walked in and said, dad, I'm hungry. And you're like, Oh, fend for yourself. I'm doing the show. Uh, you know, so it's pr pretty funny how, how food sometimes is the center of the universe, you know, because if you're starving, you can't think of anything else. Well, you do it every day. You yeah, gotta eat. I, I, exactly. What's your, what's your, um, your comfort food, like what's your go-to comfort food? Well, you know, that's, that's changed, it's changed a little bit. So for the last, um, you know, like like a lot of guys my age, right? I'm 48 years old and all of a sudden I found myself at uh, 305 pounds. Maybe not everybody finds himself at 305 pounds. Yeah, everyone's like, um, chill, what? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I'm six foot five, right? So I've got a little bit of grace there. But um, uh, one of the things I... I have two main kinds of cooking that I love to do. Um, my brother that called earlier during the show uh, got me into barbecue. So I, I smoke everything and I do it on charcoals. Um, I don't have a pellet grill. Actually, I, I like prefer to, uh, to cook on actual charcoal or on, on big barrel smokers. Um, so, you know, we do every week we've got, whether it's chicken, pork shoulders, brisket, um, kind of try to rotate, rotate one of those big smoke cooks, uh, through every week. 
Uh, and I love it too, because you're cooking big chunks of meat. You can bring it to the office, share it there. Um, you can freeze it. You can turn it into multiple meals. Like brisket is awesome in a sandwich by itself. Um, throw it in a salad. You can throw it on eggs. Um, but the biggest change that I had is I've switched to keto. Like I was talking about when I, when I was just trying to get my weight back down, um, where I'm cutting out all carbs. So, uh, the other kind of cooking I'll do is, is, uh, I used to do a lot of, uh, Mexican, like a lot of pork carnitas and stuff like that. Um, the same thing, you're right. Same cuts of meat, cook big batches. Uh, but now I'm, I'm serving most of those in bowls. So a lot of, uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time cooking proteins. Um, but then I've also learned how to make vegetables taste amazing. Mm-hmm. And one of the neat things about keto is that you, uh, while you, you have to give up a lot of the carbs and your breads and your pastas, um, it's a very sauce driven diet. So, um, you're getting your energy instead of your sugars and your carbs, you're getting your energy from your fat. So, um, you know, around the house, I'm making a lot of sauces and, you know, every two, three days I'm making batches of sauces, um, uh, even things like uh, my, I make my own mayonnaise. I make my own ranch. I so, do so, everything so, from scratch. So let me ask you this, Sheldon. So you you go on keto, and obviously it's it's designed to kind of um, reposition your your body weight. It's trying to help you kind of get a handle on that. For, for you, is it sustainable? Do you find that sustainable? Because I look at myself. This is this is my thing. You know, I talk about all the things, and and you know, my comfort food is sweets. Like I, I, I don't eat, like, I love meals, uh, you know, but I can't think of what my favorite meal to make is I make a lot of food, but also I don't make a lot of food, you know, uh, being a single dad, when I have the boys, you know, I work a 10 hour day and then I've got to get them to all their hockey and all their, their sports. I often don't have time to cook. I actually found in the last, um, years since COVID and then when all their activities kind of, uh, fired back up, uh, I find myself doing the Costco pre-made meals. So I'll go in and I'll get a, 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 a meat pie for them or, or a, what is it? A chicken pot pie, maybe the, the, the tacos. Like Costco for me has a lot of offerings and it's quick. It's easy. I can do it. There's not a lot of prep. And the only thing I have to do is clean up after the meal, after we get home at night. So that's kind of become my reality when it comes to cooking. And then I go a week without the boys and I'm not a big eater because I don't want to I'm not prepping a meal for myself. I don't like to cook for myself. I like, I like to cook for people, but I, I'm not going to cook a great meal for myself. So I have this really weird imbalance of h- how I serve and how I prepare food. Whereas, you know, a few years ago I was making all these meals, you know, I, I, I worked a different shift when I was in the far hall, you know, so I didn't have my kids, you know, maybe four days in a row. So I would prepare some meals at home when I was off, but now I have more of a, of a regular daytime shift. So I've, I'm finding that part hard. Uh, creating new meals. But for me personally, uh, and I'll get to the question I asked you, I'm getting back to sustainability is I'm big into sweets, right? You know that I have a sweet tooth, whether it's, you know, chocolate, candy, uh, muffins. And for me, that's my real barometer for my weight. You know, like, uh, again, culturally, it was a big thing in our home, the sweets. And when those holidays hit where you start with, you know, uh, you hit Halloween, then you hit Christmas, then you hit Valentine's and then you hit Easter. It's just like one, you know, waterfall of sweets after another. And, 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 you know, I'm right in it. I'm riding that wave and then I'm trying to recover because my weight fluctuates. I'm about 280 pounds right now. So for me, religious, uh, uh, celebration that I celebrate is, is Lent, which happened last week. And it's the kickoff or Ash Wednesday is the kickoff to Lent which is, represents the 40 days leading up to Easter. And that's usually in the Catholic faith, you either give up something or you do something that you wouldn't otherwise do. And I use that as an opportunity to give up all sweets. So I give up, uh, you know, any junk food, uh, any um, processed baked goods, uh, any uh, fast food, soft drinks, I give it all up. And I always use that. So as, are, are you are you supposed to give all that stuff up for Lent? Or like, no, you're not. a lot it's, of things to give up. It, it's, it's a choice, right? But I'm an all or nothing person. I'm not good at moderation. Yeah. I'm not good at moderation. So I have to give it all up so that I can I could see the benefit. And I've done this for a number of years. And Lent, uh, you know, kicks off my sort of weight loss uh, trip into the summer where, you know, I might drop down from, you know, playing weight 280 down to 260. And every year I do it. And it's like, 
I feel great. Easter comes up. I'm not craving sugars. I'm not craving e- eating fast food. I'm not craving soft drinks. And I feel better about myself. I know I look look better uh, because I trim a lot of the fat off with 40 days of not eating sugar. But then it's like one thing happens. And then I'll, I'll ingest something sweet or, or something. And it's like I'm right very slowly right back up there. And I find that that's my uh, curve. For me, I found it's not sustainable. And I don't know what, what to do when I get to that end point where, hey, I feel pretty good. I'm 260 pounds. You know, how do I, how do you maintain versus right back up there? So, so that's so the question you, I have for you. Go ahead. What's the question? Is that, it is that, sustainable? Is it sustainable? Oh, I set you know, that up. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the wrong guy to ask because I'm like you, right? I, I go through the same thing. It used to be when I was training all the time, um, you know, the five, 10 pounds you put over from Thanksgiving till Christmas was just gone by January 15th, right? Yeah. You're right back on it. And now I just find that every year I, I, I tend to, it, it just gets harder to do. Um, there was one year, Sheldon, um, one year, I kind of saw the writing on the wall that uh, I wasn't going to be playing much longer. And the type of player they wanted in my position as a long snapper was someone that was lighter and faster that can contribute to more special teams and um, be that guy. Because at that time, I was 200 and I think I had played the previous season at 270 to 280 pounds. So my goal was to come back next year like lean, mean, trim, and fit. And I'll never forget, I I believe it was uh, the start of 2013. I weighed in after Christmas time at 295 pounds. So I was huge. Like, and that's, that's what happens after Christmas. You know, you just don't pay attention. You take a few weeks off training, you're eating more. So I started January at 295 pounds and I really committed to fitness. I was doing uh, some mixed martial arts training. I remember you actually introduced me to coffee. You were the one that introduced me to coffee yeah. the first time. I had never drank coffee until I had my second child. And if you recall, when I started drinking coffee, it was like three sugars, three creams. Yeah. And I would drink the – or I would do a half double-double, half hot chocolate. That's the only way I could I could uh, uh, ingest coffee. And I always remember we were sitting at the real estate office. You and I were working together, and you said, Chef, I'm telling you one day you're going to appreciate – once you get used to drinking black coffee – you're going to love it. And I could not believe you at the time. I, I thought you were nuts. I was like, I don't even like this garbage I'm drinking. I drink it because I get no sleep. So anyway, fast forward to that year, 2013, I made a commitment to uh, cut out my sugars. Uh, I, I cut out all the sugars out of my drink. So I wasn't drinking pop. I, I went straight to black coffee. Again, I went from three, three creams, three sugars, right to black coffee. Uh, I was doing a lot more cardio because I was doing the MMA stuff. I committed to not eating a thing after dinner. So dinner time, I had a nice big meal. And then at night, man, I would I would stand in the pantry with my mouth open waiting for food to jump in, figuratively, because literally it was my hand grabbing stuff. And I said, I had to stop doing that. And I stopped doing that. Uh, I remember I would be starving at night, like just like I know. Ne- I never went to bed hungry in my life. I was, you know, I was like you. We played D-line. We were, we, were, we were meant to be big. So I didn't understand what it was to have that feeling. And I used to have this mantra in my head. I said, uh, don't eat anything now. So let's say it was past dinner between anywhere from 8 till midnight. I said, don't eat dinner now, but tomorrow have an awesome breakfast. And I started with that mantra. Now, I didn't always have an awesome breakfast the next day, but – it got me to the next morning without ingesting more calories. And uh, I went, gosh, I drank uh, water only. Sorry, I saw you drinking. I'm like, I drank I, I, I drank water only. I didn't drink soft drinks. Coffee went black. Um, I remember I ate a lot of nuts in between meals, like uh, almonds and peanuts. And I came to camp that year in June. Uh, I was 245 pounds. I've not been 245 pounds since my second year of university. Yeah. And that year I dropped to 245 pounds, which was the lowest I had ever been. I remember I walked in the first day of training camp and Tim St. Pierre, who was uh, my roommate on the roads. He was also a fellow long snapper, great, awesome guy. First thing he looks up to me, he's like, Hey chef, what happened? Did you get cancer? <laughs> it was that drastic, right? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't tell that was that drastic because I kind of lived that weight loss. 
Now, this is the point of the so story. Is it, it, what, is is it, is it, okay. story. I thought you were still asking a question. So no, no, no. I'm there. getting there. This is the point of the story. I was telling you a story. I was 245 pounds. I, I was feeling awesome. I actually had abs. Like, it was good, man. I felt like not good. shadow abs. Like not no, no, I, I had abs. I like I was, uh, you know, I still had a lot of muscle mass, but I leaned down. Yeah. And this is how it went. Now you know how training camp goes with the Stampeders. You you go to the to the training camp two weeks. They feed you, you know, big meals. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna have a little bit because you could have as much as you want. Just have one little plate. How much? You know, keep keep the rhythm. Then the season starts, and they start. You know, try and entice guys to stay after practice to watch film. And what do they do? They bring in pizza. They bring in chicken, fried chicken. And the first month, it's July, and you're just sitting there in your locker room like, okay, I'm leaving. You know, you take off. That's July. And then August, you're like, well, maybe I'll sneak a slice. Uh, September, you know, you're you're taking two or three pizzas. By October, you're grabbing a whole – uh, pizza box and hiding in your locker, maybe bringing the eating, leftovers home. Yeah, 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 yeah maybe yeah. Eating one in the locker, and, the, and then by you know by November it's 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 done. And you're you know I was back up to two hundred and seventy eight pounds because food just like it's a switch for me. So do you uh, do you remember? Did you ever play? What well, do you remember? Did you ever play with Danny McManus? No, no. Oh uh, yeah, we did, we did, we did. He, yes, we did. He had one year. I was with him in Hamilton and yeah. Edmonton when I was just like at training camps and trying yeah. to get into the league. Uh, and then, yeah, a year probably with uh, the Stampeders. Um, but he was one of those guys too. As his career went, he was battling that more and more. And I don't know if it was the same thing, like a sugar thing, but he would come into training camp looking like an athlete. And anybody that remembers Danny McManus, he wasn't known for being an athletic quarterback. Uh, he wasn't a runner. Um, um, but he could get rid of the ball faster. I think he could run an offense like no other. Um, he would come into training camp at like 205, 210, ripped, cut, looking amazing. But every year by Labor Day, um, you know, he'd be putting on 20, 30 pounds. And by the end, he looks like a guy leaning up on a bar stool. He would yeah. still play at a high level, but it's interesting how you see everybody's got their own battles with different things. So, Back to the original question, is this sustainable? Well, I'm not going to pretend to be a keto expert. I, I, and I really don't like people that throw out opinions when they don't know what they're talking about. But from the keto standpoint, here's what I do. Um, I, I keep my carbs at 30 grams or less per day, right? So as a Ukrainian guy, I like my pierogies and cabbage rolls and things like that, right? So those those had to go. Um, um, so I, you, just, you just stop buying the foods that you can't eat. Now, I also love sauces, and the, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but when you're in keto, um, 70% of your calories come from fats, right? Not 70% of your food that you eat, but 70% of the calories come from fats. What the fats do is, one, they feed your brain. It's a great energy source beyond sugar, and all carbohydrates just turn to sugar within minutes after you eat them anyway, right? Yeah. Um, and sugars are what cause so many different health problems from cancers to autoimmunes to all kinds of different things. I, the first thing, and I've only been in this for about three weeks, um, but the first, even, even weird things, you know how as you get older, you got to wake up and pee in the middle of the night, sometimes twice, gone, done, never again. I sleep great. I go to bed, I wake up and I go on with my day. Um, so sustainable, man, it's really tough because everybody around you is always, always eating carbs. I had a family event at a hotel this weekend um, I tried to do well and I ordered chicken wings, but the only things they had were breaded wings, right? So I'm taking a few grams of carbs. Um, um, but honestly, you're getting your protein that you need. You're getting the healthy fats that you need and you have enough fats to keep you full. So I'm not binging at night. Like, and, and actually the really strange thing about it is, is, um, a lot of times, like I wake up the next morning, I have coffee. Uh, I put as much cream as I want in there. You could actually put like, you can put different oils and stuff in your coffee as well. Um, the bulletproof and coffee. It, and it doesn't bulletproof coffee and it doesn't bring you out of ketosis. And ketosis is just when you're in this, um, just this hyper, uh, energy burning stage, you're burning your fats, right? You're, you're not burning all the sugars that you put in your system. You're just burning your fats. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of days I don't eat till two, three, four o'clock the next day. 
Uh, my last meal is usually around nine. I don't stop eating at seven. I, if you know, I have my last snack around ten. Um, yeah, there, there are so. But many yeah, ways. but it is. Yeah, I, I think what I'm trying to say is it works for me. Right. It's sustainable, but once you start buying those foods or once you start cheating, it's really easy just to let it slide. And that's. Oh, yeah. I think for me that's a big challenge. I'm only three weeks in. I had one cheat weekend. Uh, other than that, yeah, I'm under. I'm under twenty five. 30 gra- uh, grams of carbs a day. They say under 20, but because I'm 300 pounds, I have a little bit of grace on that when you figure it out in the calculator. But uh, Well, well um, I'm a week of no sweets, and uh, it feels terrible. I'm not going to lie. It feels terrible. Like, it usually takes about 10 days to kick that. Um, there's It almost like the ingestion of sweets for me almost brings me to an equilibrium, which is crazy to think. Kind of like you know when they you know when they talk about sort of that functioning alcoholic, they need to have a certain level of alcohol in their blood to function properly. Otherwise, it, it brings them down. I think I'm like that with sugar, and I go into sugar withdrawals. And and I think it's it's been documented that sugar does that to people. So I'm on I guess would be considered day seven of no sugar, and uh, I haven't been super moody, but I don't feel super energetic and and. Uh, uh, but but it does work for me. I get through this cycle. Um, but there are so many things. You know, I, I know a lot of people that do the fasted uh, uh, cardio uh, to to kickstart a weight loss regime. You know, there's so many different. I, I don't think you can work fads. your. You, you, I don't think you can work your work out your way out of losing weight, though. No, no, like, that, like, it is. It's all what you put into your so, system. It's so like the your diet, body. the diet is not a thing. Like you, 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 you work out so that you can eat crap food because I. I subscribe to that theory when I'm at my worst. It 100% works until you hit like 32. Right. But you know what probably is the – I mean probably it's, it's, it's well documented that, that the, the, the toughest thing on our bodies and specifically males uh, when it comes to uh, diets and calories and uh, body composition – uh, you know, unfortunately, it's something that many people have an issue with, it, which is uh, alcohol ingestion, right? I'm not yeah. talking about I'm not talking about alcoholic levels. I'm just talking about uh, regular consumption of alcohol um, is, is a huge contributor to to weight gain. You know, the, if we're talking about carbs and we're talking about sugars and we're talking about storing that in our bodies as fat, you know, you go out for a night for wings with your buddies and have two, three beer. And that's a regular thing, whether it's regular in the week, once or twice a week, or whether it's regular in your month, you know, like four times a month, that habit over the year contributes to your weight gain. And, and you know, people have a hard time with that. And and as you said, just, just like with the food, like if you watch uh, any sporting event, you know, I, I like watching sports on TV. Most of my, my programs I consume on streaming services, so you don't see this much. But if you watch live sports, for instance, hockey or football, Every commercial is either food, like go buy a Baconator or go buy a Big Mac, or it's a dessert, go get a Blizzard or go get a Frosty, or it's beer, or it's any one of those vices, right? Like the only ones they can't put on, on TV are cannabis and smoking because or, or, you're not allowed. Or, 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 or the pharmaceuticals that they now put into you to help – uh, counteract the the effects of all that bad food that we're putting into our system. Yeah, so it's it's, it's quite a quite a societal conundrum, and really, I, I I think if you eat good foods, so good foods in uh, and good workouts, you could find that balance. But we are bombarded with the images of um and 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 i guess the marketing towards the foods that are not good for us and and the the, the drinks that are not good for us those you know i went to buy a bottle of water the other day <laughs> i went to buy a bottle of water the other day at the pharmacy i was like i had no water so i'm going to the pharmacy and i'm kind of cheap right so i'm looking for the cheapest bottle of water and they have all the you know the ones with the fancy you know they have the aquafina no no aquafina is the cheap one they had like the evian and the smart water the smart and, waters yeah and then you get the dasani and then we're getting to to my brand like the cheap one uh, which is aquafina and then you're getting like the life brand or whatever so that's kind of the range and it's like it goes from five dollars for a 500 milliliter bottle to 229 for the aquafina and I'm looking right next. Now I'm trying to cut out sugars. 
I'm looking right next to it. So the 500 liter bottle of cheap Aquafina is 229. Okay. The 500 milliliter bottle of Gatorade was uh, 225 or two dollars, something like that. It was less. Two for three dollars. Right? No, I yeah. think it was 199. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. That's just water with stuff in it. How do you yeah. put stuff in the water and it goes down in value? And it's like, it's stuff that I don't want. And I'm really cheap. And I'm having a philosophical dilemma here in the pharmacy because I'm like, I know I want the water, but the freaking water with the stuff in it that's bad for me, that's supposed to taste better, is cheaper than the stuff that tastes like nothing that actually is water. Yeah. And I, I, and so, like, I'm having this dilemma here. Now, in the end, I, I, I got off my wallet for the extra 25 cents and I bought the water. But that is, that's how they get us, right? They, they get you, yeah, like, yeah, buy the, my, my kids, they love this iced tea. It's 99 cents. It's like a bazooka barrel can of iced tea. And they're like, dad, but it's only 99 cents. But it's like, that's how they get you, right? They make but, it and, and, and sweet. And, and that's what that. they do. They do get you because nobody gets, uh, it was well, funny. I, I shouldn't say nobody gets addicted to water because when you're in that good groove and you're eating healthy and you're hydrating yourself, I mean, nothing feels better than water. Yeah. But there's no kick to it. There's no, uh, there's nothing that grabs you. And like, in, unless you're like dying of thirst and dehydrated after a workout or, you know, a late night or whatever, your body's just craving water, you're always going to crave that sugary drink. That's how our bodies are made. I mean, we're, we're not that far removed, removed from being cavemen where every calorie you could get was essential to just your survival. Mm -hmm. um, we're still genetically programmed that way. And so, yeah, when you see something that's, um, you know, high in carbs, sugar, fats, um, you just start salivating over it and it just triggers something inside your mind. And so I guess what I'm saying is they can get away with that and they have the two products right in front of you, right? And, and it makes no sense why something with the additives and the flavor, I, you, you think that would be triple the amount of cost, right? But... Um, well, they know that you won't get hooked on this one. You're going to get hooked on this one. Food for thought. A liter of water costs more than a liter of gasoline. So I don't know how that works, but. <laughs> uh, you know, I never even considered that. A liter of, of gasoline is right now 129. Wow. 500 milliliters of water cost me 229. So yeah. what are we doing yeah. wrong here? Uh, there um, you go. You know, Sheldon, uh, this was a great talk. Um, I'm actually kind of hungry, but it's, it's late at night and I don't want to eat. So, uh, let's wrap this up. Let's take this home tomorrow morning. We're both going to wake up starving. What are you having for breakfast? Um, you know what, again, so I'm not going to eat till tomorrow night or late tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to have chicken. I'm probably going to do the broccoli in a heavy cream sauce with bacon, uh, seasoned up just the way I like it. And it's going to be delicious. Um, well, I'm going to tell you, like, uh, I told you a story about tuna surprise before. And every yeah. time I talk about tuna surprise, it brings me back to my days at McGill and at McGill, uh, we had Charlie Bailey. He's a legend. And I, I talk about him once in a while. And, uh, he, uh, he, it, it brings me back to him and, and thinking about Charlie Baby, Bailey. I remember one time, uh, someone came to talk about, you know, sports nutrition and, and all this stuff and all the, you know, the carbs and the fats and the, you know, and eat a proper meal and this and that. And I remember Coach Bailey was just chewing on his cigar and he said, guys, he says, what's wrong with a peanut butter and banana sandwich? So when I wake up tomorrow morning, I'm going to think about Coach Bailey. I'm going to slice up some bananas. I'm going to put on some rye bread. I'm going to slap on some peanut butters. I have my carbs. I have my little bit of protein. And I got my, uh, my energy from the banana. And then I'm going to have a nice a cup of black coffee like Sheldon told me about 14 uh, years ago. 14 years ago. Started my that long? 14 years ago is when Brett there was born. Go. Yeah, wow. man. So uh, with that, I, I think we're out, man. I'm hungry.